Franz Oswald. He is currently assistant professor in architecture at Cornell University. He has also been a teaching assistant in the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland. He was educated at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, the University of Bern in Switzerland, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich with a diploma in architecture in 1963, a master in architecture in urban design at Cornell in 1966. Some of the positions he has held are assistant to the city and regional planning agency of the Ruhr region in Essen, Germany, 1961, associate in the architecture office of Professor Bernhard Husley in Zurich, job captain for various buildings, especially for a large housing and urban renewal project for Cologne, Grunzug, Sud, Germany, in the office of Professor O.M. Ungers, Cologne and Berlin, Germany, from 1963 to 1965. Lately, or at least uh, uh, earlier in this year, he was consultant to the project for the redevelopment of Central Harlem in Manhattan, sponsored and exhibited in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, 1967. And this project is currently in most of the of recent issues of the architectural magazines. So uh, you should avail yourself of the opportunity of looking these up in our library. Among the awards, his background list is the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology Traveling Fellowship, a Cornell Graduate Fellowship, and a Cornell Faculty Research Grant. He is speaking tonight on Harvard University's uh, Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts, designed by Le Corbusier. Mr. Oswald. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Zappenfield, for your introduction. Certainly, again, a great pleasure to be with you tonight. <clears throat> I would like to present to you some of the possible speculation which can occur before a building is designed and maybe after it is designed and standing there. As you all know, the design process is quite a complicated one and it does not follow a linear path of cause and consequence, but it sometimes goes a very diversified path. So the result is sometimes also very ambiguous, the result of a building. And what I'm trying to do this evening is to explain or to speculate a little bit about some of the assumptions which the author Le Corbusier could have made during the design process of the Visual Arts Center at Harvard. Now, on the left-hand side, you see the um, site plan. Sorry, I hope this is the uh, last time that I'm conflicting with the technology. <laughs> um, here is part of the Harvard campus with its architectural building, Robinson Wall, at this point. And as immediately, you can see the building, which is the topic of our evening. I show you before I'm going into any sort of speculation, a quick pass around the building and through it. What we immediately observe is that obviously it is of what, as laymen one could say, quite a funny shape. It's 
not similar to any one of the buildings around itself and it seems to be in a kind of very awkward uh, position within the site. It does not take up at first glance any of the particular directions of the streets, Westcott and Quincy, or it does not take the direction of Broadway or of this street here. It also is not parallel to any one of the buildings around. So what is it? It's a building. Let's try to approach the building from the present architectural school following this path, which you see here. And that is the first glance. As we expect, this surface here is not parallel to this one, but makes here a convex corner. And at the same time, on a lower level, around, sorry, concave corner, and around this concave corner is wrapped around an upper surface, apparently it may be relating the disparate parts of the building again to each other. We proceed further, and in a close-up, this corner, the round form, becomes to be more predominant. But it seems to be very much perforated at this point, so that it could indicate that one can go through, or at least look through, this building, or this form. The wall, or the surface, surface you can see at this point, is also very much perforated. It has different kinds of treatment. It is ambiguously solid at this point, ambiguous because it is glass and literally can expand. On the other side here, it's pretty soft edge and still dense, and one still can read pretty much the continuity of the whole surface. surface. So that maybe one can speculate again, probably it can be perforated or one can circulate through this surface coming from another direction. All of a sudden here we see this structure, which apparently are the columns, going through the different floor, uh, the last floor plane, performing at this point a pergola, throwing shadows and shade on the space up on the roof. We remind that techniques of that sort were also in buildings of the Renaissance, but instead of being continuously columns from bottom to top, we have on the top of the, on the, top of the column, we have sculptural fittings. But maybe these columns are the same particular thing. The building seems not to end here, but seems to end up there. And fills open up the space so you can look diagonally up and we can perceive the, where the building ends on the top and not just being cut flat like with a razor blade. If we then go very close to this first particular form here, indeed we see that even our pass leads underneath it and if the slide was a little bit better exposed at this point, we could even walk through the whole building. So that the suggestion which it gave to us, that continuing this diagonal path, what could go through was correct. Now, let's turn around and walk along Quincy Street and look how the building looks from there. We are standing at this point and looking at the building in this direction. Here what happens is that all of a sudden the sidewalk seems to break away from the ground and become a continuous pass and form of a land penetrating directly into the building, into this surface here, which at the very beginning when we saw it the first time allowed some sort of penetration visually, and indeed the pass goes through, that meandering around the trees these apparently were not cut, but they were incorporated from the very beginning into the geometry, into the geometry of the layout of the building. 
And as such, they see maybe later on to keep the continuation of the, exter in the exterior of the calamity which generates structurally the whole building. If we go on then, we go close to the end, and always the, all of a sudden the density, the massiveness of the surface at which, at which we look obliquely from the other side before, becomes on both levels has the same apparent um, sparseness. You can go through to penetrate into the building there in my very secret. And indeed, when we then are up on the top of the ramp, at this point, you finally see that through this plane, you're going to punch and be into a space from which you can look on either side into the building. And here, we don't quite know what happens now. Is this inside the building, or is it a reflection of the things which were behind me? Well, I don't know. Maybe we see it later. At any case, one is pretty much astonished and surprised to see this incredible effect, because all of a sudden, things which were in the exterior are now in the interior, and it's an incredible kaleidoscope going on. It seems that every time we pass through the building and we turn around these facets of the kaleidoscope, other visual aspects come into existence. We go through the ramp, go completely through it, go down it, uh, this way, and go at this point and look back where we came through a little bit briefly, because probably we are quite surprised by the incredible spatial experience which we had, and looked, and looked at the building as it exists from the other side. Again, the surface here seems not to be in the same direction as this existing building, as we can see there, and it seems to be of a completely different nature than the surface before. It is denser, it is more solid. Why is it? We don't know yet. Maybe because of orientation. Maybe because of a certain diversification of the site. Because certainly, if we come from here, we see that the building is oriented basically towards the main, the heart of the, of the campus, of the Harvard campus, which seems to be here. And the future extension of the Harvard campus project in Dawi does not exist yet. So it seems to be quite appropriate to speculate that this is the front and this is the back. And with a very subtle way, this seems to be expressed at this point of the facade, where indeed the, the facade expresses more closure, more density than it expressed on this side, so that one really maybe it's in spite of the fact that the same element of turf, brisole and so forth. Uh, with a different application of the same element, I can express the, the fact of the building. Then I also realize that I have the same particular form which I have in the, on the other side, but on a completely different level. It's higher up, and again it allows, because it's higher up, it allows views, possible penetration around this corner, and it also opens up the view to this facade of the existing building so that this facade may participate as the building itself to the definition of this space down below. Incredible things start to happen. Let's go around it a little bit more and look again a little bit closer to this particular form here where you really can recognize how this facade is not only opened up. I not only see what happened on this facade, but it also participates again very strong to the definition of the space underneath this uh, object and, um, and the building. Furthermore, again, I see here the trees seem to play a um, very interesting um, game with the columns of the building, so that one almost could say, well, the trees are nothing else but um, the extension of the columns, or the columns are artificial trees, whatever you would like to say. And finally, to look 
at this two form, at this form from two angles, because of its different heights than the other one, with its particular treatment, the building is exposed at its, at its base. The ground is exposed to not only this facade on this side of the building was free, but also the ground is exposed and continues through the building without being interrupted by itself and allowing not only, as we just made experience, a penetration through the building, through on the land, as an extension of the sidewalk, communicating the two sidewalks of either Quincy and Prescott Street, but it also around, uh, allows, apparently, a circulation, a penetration around the building. Now, after presenting very shortly the building itself, how it might appear in a few, in a sequence of uh, shots, let's go a little bit deeper into the building and ask ourselves, how is it made? What are the elements? What are the components of the building? <coughs> For this purpose, it seems to be appropriate to go back to some of the basics of Le Corbusier's way to organize space. I'm sure that you all know these two slides. On the left-hand side, the prototypical drawing for all the spaces which Corbusier made from the minute he conceived of this drawing. A structure, column structure, supporting slabs, floor slabs. The floor slabs defining horizontal slices, slices of space, which allows all of a sudden this works a bit. The structure, construction, is a separate element from the space defining element. Of course, immediately, this allows a dialectic again between the two things. A system of space-defining walls, a system of space-defining elements, played and used against a system of structural elements which hold up the building. Here, we see that both things are still integral of one another. Here, one has to use, in a conventional way, structural walls and space defining elements, but here the two things are completely diversified. An incredible amount of diversity, of variety, and of combination is possible. The next very prototypical model for space definition is this one, Maison Citroën, conceived basically at the same time but now no longer a space, a uh, separation between structure and uh, between uh, space defining elements, but a system of pairing walls easily to perceive as repetitive in one way or another. And the effect of this system is now that the spaces are no longer basically <coughs> defined as horizontal slices, but as vertical slices. This thing is nothing else but just the reverse of Maison Domino. Take Maison Domino, which we saw on this slide here, tilt it 90 degrees and put the floors and see it at wall, and then you have this. And this kind of game, which immediately starts from the two basic fundamentals, how to organize space, seems to be the theme of the whole work, architectural work of Le Corbusier, as we can see very easily, even in these two elements. Even in this building, which you all certainly know, the Villa Poissy, uh, Villa Savoy in Poissy, which is usually shown as the prototype or built prototype of Maison Domino. Even Villa Savoy has parts of the Maison Citron at this point, where the column is hidden behind the surface, so that the building is not equal on all the four sides, but has a very clear front. 
at this point where you <coughs> penetrate through the building. You establish a facade, a plane through which, through which you puncture in order to go into it. Or you another combination of the two basic fundamental uh, spatial um, <coughs> or way of organizing, namely the frame of the unity conceived at Maison Domino and Maison Citron taken as a unit and sliced into Maison Domino. Now, <coughs> from this point, maybe uh, we should ask, sorry. There is something wrong. Right. We should ask ourselves, going back to again some of the uh, diagrams of Le Corbusier, at the end of the first book, which are so predominantly important, has our building, which you see in the model on the right hand side, in a preliminary stage, anything to do with the four basic approaches which Corbusier develops after a year, after about 10 years of e experimenting and testing with its basic notions of space organization. Has it anything to do with this, the type of Villa La Roche? expressing the different spaces of the program as individual entities and somehow relating them together, probably with a column grid. Very easy, he says, very gentle, picturesque, fulfills emotional requirements. Or has our building anything to do with this particular approach, which was fulfilled and uh, fulfilled its requirements in Villa Garge, taking a basic form, a uh, cube, and carving out <coughs> spaces of it? Or is it this particular approach here, the literal application of the structure versus the space-defining elements, which he exercised in the built version of, Villa Carta in, of the villa in Carthago in Egypt, which he hated because it was too literal, or is it this particular approach to define basically a space, a horizontal slice of spaces, and, define, and again carving out uh, not only interior spaces as here, but also exterior spacing on its top. I don't know whether our building has anything to do with this four different way of organizing space. I hope that we can find a possible answer this evening. Before we go into the building, how it finally was built, let's look at the two, at the model of a preliminary stage of it, so that we can compare with what kind of things the Corbusier seemed to have struggled before he finally built the building. Here, what we realize is that it's somehow a mixture, a very ambivalent and or ambiguous mixture between the Met Vindalaros, the first slide on this side, between this, so in that no more, of course, not in fact in the same way. Does not are the different functions of the building or the different spaces expressed as solid somehow grouped to each other, but the planes, the different floor of the building, start to slide out, to emerge, to cantilever out from the basic building mass itself. But at the same time, it has something to do with this uh, in the way how the upper portion is treated. And at the same time, maybe it has something to do with that, because maybe we are going to see in a later stage that he is again tweaking uh, the elements of the space, of space defining elements in the inside in the same way as how is it there. But also, again, not really. Everything recalls that, but then we see that it's still basically a mass. We even see that there seems to be the idea of a base on which the building rests of a podium, 
Um, any particular notion of a basic form uh, in front of which things are put is not existing, it reminds us somehow in the treatment of the floor to flats handling out or projecting out from the central floor. It, it, it uh, reminds us some of the techniques of Franklin like Wright, but again not really. Uh, what is it then? Now, here you have a few axonometric, uh, in two axonometric drawings, some of uh, the <coughs> ground floor plan of the existing building and the next plan of the uh, existing building. Is it in focus now? No. Again, of course, the inevitable column structure. But already here at this point, we realize that the columns are not to be defined within a container uh, basic form. The columns seem to be uh, at this point here almost distributed deliberately, making a wood, almost a wood, a forest, within which and around which a container is defined. And this container has very specific characteristics. It consists out of a very solid wall at this point, and especially at this point here, and of a number of glass planes, the yellow ones there. And it also, the container seems not to be within the whole area which is defined by the columns. Here we see a very strong concave um, <coughs> corner which is defined in the rest of it. It's here is defined by the columns. <coughs> here we see again a very strong indentation and both seem to project the possibility of the penetration here and the penetration to there. Furthermore, again, another very important indentation at this point here, which suggests again that probably a pass or a sort of penetration might go through there. But here, in contrast to this particular corner, this area is not at all defined uh, very clearly by the column structure. On the other side, we know that the columns are here in order to support the floor above, so that maybe that in a later stage we find out that the way how the form of the upper floor is made is maybe quite relevant for the siting or for this whole definition of the space of this area. Here this is the next floor. And the relationship of the building mass to the column structure comes quite different. No longer is the edge here so penetrable? No. It's one of the most unpenetrable forms there. It's convex, very difficult to penetrate, projects out. At this point here, another form intersects into the column grid, which makes, in contrast to this area, also to this corner very soft and this corner too which of course means opening up of these two corners and allowing penetration into the building or using the building at this point and the same way allowing penetration and using the building from this point. Here we realize that the ramp starts to become a problem and starts to become an, uh, a very important feature on this level, uh, on this floor. As here, the surface of the glass was very hard and unpenetrable, almost recalling the base which we saw in the model on this side, but now no longer as a solid, but as a glass, as a crystal. Here, the wall becomes penetrable, softer, sparser than on this side. And because the next floor is up, 
And here we see now the element of the land and indeed the education which we uh, realized on the bottom floor had some meaning because it's exactly there where the land cuts the building into two halves. That is a plan where really one almost can see two buildings in one. The glass, again, very relevant, in the interior completely open, though you have views into the spaces on either side, opening it up towards the corner here, but not allowing all the openness and relationship and the sun coming in at this point, but at this facade, so that the light is pretty much directly coming in through this piece of light. The same thing happens here, that the views are framed constantly by a repetition of piece of around this surface and around this edge. Here we realize again <coughs> the difference in the different floors or heights of the two sides. Here we can step on this one, it becomes a roof terrace, while here, coming from here, we penetrate into this form. And up on top, finally, on the level above that, we see another part of the building, almost recalling the principle of Villa Citron of Villas, so that what here happens can almost be recalled as being the principle of Maison Domino, with this space defining, space containers, popping out instead of being within a plain form. And here, up on top, we see, especially if you look at the very strong surface and the complete enclosed surface around this area, some ideas again of Villa Citron, the stressing of the para parallelity of these two surfaces versus the penetration and perforation of the two surfaces of this thing. So again, this very um, complicated game of the two basic notions seem maybe to have any particular um, importance in this um, building. And here finally, from the stair, from the major uh, work for circulation, almost as a left or as a figure on this top podium, on this top, uh, Moldes, another building which becomes in a later stage from the function point of view an apartment. Again, we have not only in a horizontal section two buildings sliced or divided by the land, but it seems that we also have in the vertical section two buildings, one which goes to the ceiling or to the floor of this particular floor here, and another one which is being established between this floor and this floor using this floor here as a podest, as a podium for the upper last floor. Now maybe this has anything to do with the fact or with the problem, how do you end a building vertically? When do you stop the continuity of floors? What determines the end of an increased height or of the repetition of levels. Now, maybe that prophecy had some of the Renaissance building in mind, where there was a very clear hierarchy of the different levels, and it was absolutely no accident when the final cornice was laid on top of the columns, and on top of the cornice, as a slight indication of the column structure, the sculptural figures. Maybe that you can see at the building, that you can see at least look at this level as if it would be the traditional cornice covering up and stopping the building below. And here finally only, especially at this point, a recalling of the sculptural figures on top of Renaissance palaces. But this is not only the reason. The reason seems also to be that, of course, the more you go up in the floor, the more you proceed upwards into a building, the less contact, the less communication you have with the ground level, the more private it becomes, the ground level being the public circulation, being where the public is in contact with the building, the more you go away from this basic 
a plane, the more the building increases itself in privacy, the more you don't have anything to look for up on top. And it seems to be quite obvious that functionally up on top of the most hidden, in the most disguised area, you have the living quarters. So that formal reasons are backed up with functional reasons. Now, if we look at the facades, of course, the building cannot look, be looked at very uh, meaningful in conventional terms to look at the flat facade. Maybe it's not very nice if you look at the building just in this way. Maybe it looks like this. And two-dimensional meaning to represent a spatial idea seems not to be quite uh, appropriate if we all of a sudden realize that our building looks that way. Here, just only to stress the point, we see again that the facade facing 20th Street, in which you penetrate the first of the building, is really quite open. It's glassed in at this point, versus uh, the facade of Prescott Street here, which is really quite close in and expressing the um, difference between a possible back and a possible front. But on the other side, we realized too at the very beginning, since we could circulate and pass through the building and go around itself, the meaning, uh, the relevance of being back and front is not quite great, because if you can walk around the building, it seems not to be, not to have a back and a front, but it seems to be an object. It's something which you can perceive and experience from every side. So what he, does, what he did here is just only maybe a very slight and very subtle um, differentiation between one side and the other. Here you see which elements are in intensifying the closeness of the building, maybe the three solids, and here at the last, which you see on the other side, which is better, uh, the <coughs> the last recall of the podium that now comes in the solid, which is completely cast in. If you look at the other facades, again, the two-dimensional drawing seems not to be very relevant. That is, the facade <coughs> showing in a very oblique slide to this way, where the object going around the concave corner of this thing is in a lower plane, while the other object of the other facade <coughs> here is going around the whole building of, um, in another, on another level. So that if we perceive the building correctly, again, the stress of being an object is made even stronger because of the two, of the two forms penetrating out of the building on two different levels, some sort of a spiral seems to be implied in the whole composition, which we will see much stronger in a later diagram. Now, let's look just very briefly how apparently this <coughs> whole facade, which is this one here, but looking from a different angle, it's a slide of this same facade is taken from there, like that, changed incredibly during, while uh, from this stage to the finally built stage. While here, we were left over in a very ambiguous and ambivalent mood, where we couldn't really decide what the building, how the building was organized, whether it was things coming out of a, of a core, planes projecting out of the central core, or whether it was an uh, object uh, placed in front of a plane, now here it's made very clear. This apparently seems to be a very strong plane with the two towers coming up there, and in front of this plane, an object is placed. But at the same time, we know from the plan which we saw before, the object is just not only placed in front of it, but at the same time, it emerges out of the building. 
A seam, which again recalls in us Maison Citron, the blank parallel wall in front of which an object is placed. A seam which Le Corbusier played in, in indefinite numbers of buildings. One of the nicest examples of the seam wall versus object is in the side facade of La Tourette, of the Church of La Tourette, where the side chapels again are placed and related to the main church in this similar fashion. So now, the building which is finally built is a very clear statement. It's no longer in the same way ambiguous in its organizational intentions as the model over there would show. Here you see the other side of the building and again, very clear uh, flat surface and in front of this flat surface, this object placed in front of it, but actually also penetrating out of the building. Now, if we finally come to a conclusion and summarize up what happens in the formal organization of the building, then we see a very few elements at work. First, a cube. Second, the two forms interpenetrated, <laughs> sliced into the cube. Third, a stair tower, again, sliced into the cube at one particular corner and sandwiching basically like a hamburger, the building is there. And the two forms here defining the space through which the ramp goes. Now, if you look and if you think about the way this building is organized volumetrically, with all this very intriguing penetration, and by the way, here you can take, probably see much clearer that there seems to be a clear spiral movement around the building implied with the placement of the two forms on different heights. So if you think about this organization, interpenetration of volumes, not just only stacking volumes at one another, but interpenetration, relating space and volume to each other, space and space container relating transparently to each other. Then we can tell to recall similar ways of organizing two-dimensional planes of the cubistic area, especially if you look how this painting by Fu and Lee around 1920 was organized. Also, instead of now volumes, so I'm painting planes interpenetrating other planes, other forms, and not just only in a literal way, because every plane at this point participates at the definition of the other plane as well. If you take, for instance, this form, which supposedly is the head of a class, it as it well defines this form here, or is defined by this form here, as it is itself. If you look where the truths end, then certainly it's not arbitrary that the truths, the breaks, and the peach here end up there, because they help to redefine the edge, the boundary of this newspaper, so to speak. Here, the table of, uh, of the structure of the table uh, is again defined, this does not only define a being within the table, but this form here, where the shadows, so to speak, of the glass are, where, for instance, the intersection of this diagonal piece there, of the other shadow, of the other glass legs, they do, as forms, are not only self <coughs> self-existing, but they help to define and to redefine the other form which seems to slide or to slide under or to slide in front of it. The same principle seems to be at work in this building. Well, that is not so new. We knew this before that Corbusier was using um, <coughs> Uh, the same kind of techniques, the literal transparency in its class, 
and the phenomenon of transparency, which was developed by the Cubists in order to redefine and to relay forms to each other and the meanings of the forms to each other. We will find out a little bit later what actually the revolutionary kind of aspect of the building might be. Now, <clears throat> I have to stop here a few minutes and to, read, uh, to go a little bit back to another issue. One of the first pages of the first volume, Esprit Nouveau, shows the basic forms with which Corbusier will work for the rest of his life. He tries to teach his fellow architects to think about basics. Now, for our particular interest is this whole series of diagrams. As, uh, a rectangle intersected arbitrarily by an orthogonal grid and a diagonal grid. Here, a rectangle, and taking this as an application. Here, a rectangle organized with parallel uh, lines, defining parallel strips, may be applied in this facade of a Greek temple or of a classic system. Here, taking the rectangle and just defined it arbitrarily through the middle of its sides into four quadrants, taking maybe this kind of plate part as a pestle. Or this rectangle, taking it and organizing it in com an opposite to that one with horizontal lines and horizontal strips, taking maybe a stretch into the facade of the Colosseum in Rome, or taking this rectangle and dividing it up into an arbitrary grid of uh, different amounts of rectangles, taking this factory as a test. Now, with all these elements, Corbusier worked throughout his life. But with this one here, the rectangle organized with the diamond, or subdivided with the diamond, reflected into this fresco of another play card, with this particular way to lay out the geometry and the spatial relationships, which are almost identical as this play card here. What is he apparently waiting until he built Carpenter Center? I want to go into this just in a few minutes. Now, <clears throat> question, why did he make things so complicated, Daniel? Why couldn't it be as simple as this, as he was in the, in the mill owner's building in Chandigarh, where we see traditional Corbusier techniques Defining a basic rectangle or a cube subdivided by a column grid, maison domino, even maison citron is existing with emphasizing of the two lateral walls, and in front of the buildings placing a little bit different in order to recognize different orientation and back and front of the building, the pre soleil. And here, the ramp penetrating, not quite, but almost in the middle of the building at this point. And then here is space defined by a completely different element, space defining element, by a continuous wall. Why cannot you do our building that way? Why has it to take, so to speak, this space and flip it around and put it on this side? Big question, why can't things be simple? 
Well, maybe they turn out to be very simple. Before I come to a possible sp uh, answer, I would like again to go back. I think that we can only understand Corbusier's work if we realize that in every one of his buildings and projects he did, he tried to fulfill the requirements of a prototypical solution or of an archetype. He couldn't help to be a messianic utopist. utopist. He was involved from the very beginning of his practice with utopia and had his numerous polemics for the new way of life of the machine civilization and wanted to provide and went around the world with this evangelium or with his evangelium at the hand. Well, you all know this plan, which proves that he really conceived of his whole work as being the contribution of completely new prototypical archetype, archetypical solution to our problems. Here, in this slide, you see the very well-known facade of the immeuble villa, which, unfortunately, is it more clear? Is it better? Um, <coughs> here, this is the facade of the immeuble villa, where he gives very detailed account how people might think and could live within their own open space, within their own backyard, but stacked up, making, you know, have a nice country life in the 16 small. <laughs> but he never could build it, only if he looked very carefully at the villa in Brush, and he compared the villa of the plants and the whole building of the villa Brush with the image of the villa, then you find out that Villa Garage is nothing else but the built prototypical unit of the Inverter Villa, which he proposed a few years before he built Villa Garage. So it seems that he sees even these buildings in relationship to a larger context, to a larger intention of its ways and methods to organize space and architecture. <coughs> Now, my thesis of a uh, carpenter center, why it is or might be so complicated, are two things. One thing is that because there was not really a program existing by the time the building was designed, as the story goes, Le Corbusier had just a commission to make a building. Mr. Carpenter provided a certain amount of money with the condition that it is made by a well-known and good architect. But nobody really knew what the building was for. And even nowadays, people don't really know what to do with it. <laughs> So you have to make a building without program. It's unusual for us, but it exists. <clears throat> Especially if you think in urban design terms, in large things, you have to attack a problem always without program. How do you do it? Well, we see one example. Well, I contend that because of the lack of a program, we cannot just see the building as a formal game or an exercise into space gymnastics. I think that we have to see the building as, again, one of the prototypical solutions for a specific issue. And I think that the specific issue, which he tried to resolve at this point, was to provide the image or the model for a center, for an urban center, spatially, and what the circulation is concerned. If, if you look, maybe it's, if one is not too fantastic about the comparison between this plot 
which then was applied throughout the system of the layout of Chandigarh. And if one compares a little bit the urban situation of this building, then one all of a sudden may find out that the building here, or the lot previous to the building, was quite similar in its condition to this particular point here. Namely, we have a street there, we have a street there, we have a street, a very important street here with Harvard Square up there, and we have another very important street here or there. So it seems to be quite important to relate this street to that street, as well this street to this street. And it happens that if you look at the city block of Chandika, exactly the same condition where pedestrian passes intersect happen also there. <coughs> Maybe that's why the land. <coughs> Another thing seems to be a possible speculation. Uh, before we go to that, again, another very well-known element, the ramp, the interior street, the sidewalk, was also from the very beginning one of the major elements in Le Corbusier's work. As soon as he conceived of the radiant city, he realized that the streets, as we uh, saw this afternoon, were gone as spatial entities, but they were replaced by so-called interior streets. The first project where the interior street becomes a very important issue is the project for the dormitories uh, in Paris which then he pursues through and through, and the interior street becomes even a very important feature when he travels around the U.S. of A and makes this, this uh, drawing of sketches. And here you see how he observes, maybe that would be the federal post building in Chicago with the street going underneath it, Rue Anterior, you know. So it was always a constant preoccupation to it. The interior street then finally appears in the Unites as shopping streets and in one of his last projects in the hospital of Venice, the whole hospital again is Here we see two sections of this interior street on which I don't want to elaborate too much, but here again you see that the clear what I meant with the vertical separation from the bottom to the top is more privacy up here and of course all the public space is related more to the ground down there. Now the other thesis which I claim <coughs> could have been or uh, Corbusier speculated about it is that he was involved for the first time in the diamond and in the speculations and possibilities and implications what the organization spatially of the diamond is. Having this figure which is tilted in relationship to the street but the interior organization is again parallel to the edge of the field. Here you see some sketches of Montbrun, which he made for this particular painting. Now let's observe for a very few seconds what the nature of the diamond is, taking a square, taking it in its diagonal, and looking at it in this way. Well, compare a square here, and then you find out that the only really important thing of the square is for the characteristics and actually see that way. But as soon as you see the diamond, this axis becomes important by this one here, which is purely numerical, purely quantitative, while this axis here of the diamond is a qualitative axis, which exists within of the thing itself. 
The same is true for this taxi, and of course the same is true for uh, the same vertical axis of the same, of the square. Then if we place some grid parallel to the field through the diamond, we realize that the diamond has a very complicated edge condition if we do that. The edge becomes very active versus the square, which by its formal nature is not an active edge unless we do it. But here, by intersecting one organization with another one, the edge condition becomes very, very important. We have a new possibility to organize space around a building, around the territory, because the territory is so very important. We see that we can organize lots of spaces penetrating into the center. While the square seems to be a figure from which, from, from, from the center of which something is organized out to the edge, the diamond seems to be a figure where things seem to be organized from the edge to the center. Here. Look how much more elaborate the edge is treated than the center. Now let's go back for a short while on the plant and maybe speculate a little bit about the enormous spatial effects which you get by organizing a space in that way. By the way, again here a sketch. And what he is doing is exactly the opposite. Instead of having a regular figure within a regular field, he has a regular field with Quincy Street and Prescott here and a regular figure. Now what happens here immediately? That's the ground floor plan again. We realize now that the edge condition everywhere the building starts to make an edge is always around it. It's very active while the center of the building is pretty much um, uh, untreated and pretty much uh, static. Now, first of all, we see that the column structure is related diagonally to the edge and the diagonal made from the, of the column structure is almost parallel, not quite, to the implied diagonal of this building here. The same thing is true, not quite, almost, of this diagonal implied by this, implied by this corner and by that corner. But if you look again very carefully how the column grid is laid out, then we see that the columns do not only line up in this diagonal of the existing buildings around it, but they also line up that way, so they are perpendicular to the two streets, Quincy and, and uh, Prescott, which immediately establish a very direct relationship, visually and spatially, to the edge of the street and of the site. Now let's look in a series of slides how, what kind of implications spatially this treatment of the edge has. Here again, in another slide, this particular condition. Of course, by activating the edge here, you get this penetration. You cannot throw only walk underneath it, but you can also look at it. By activating again the edge here, opening up not only one direction, but also with opening up always the edge and taking an awful lot of diagonals so that every direction actually of the ground plane involved in the site is opened up to get another penetration at this point, this slide taking, taking from this side, looking into this void. Another <coughs> penetration or another uh, look at this same condition looking from here shows how again the, there is no longer a divorce between the site and the building, 
but actually the site, the building makes the site. Now you have, and now it makes sense to work, uh, to uh, walk through. Now it, it seems to be uh, significant and meaningful to walk through the building because it's actually made that way that you can and that you have to. The building has a much closer relationship to the underrated surface of the ground than it would probably have if it would be in the same way as the two uh, adjacent building are. Let's look at it from, again, another point of view. Here, with the next type plan, with the next plan of the next upper level, we realize that this form is penetrating in the building at this point. But here, you have not only a concave surface from this point, but at the same time, on a lower level, you have a convex situation. So that, again, no divorce between building and site, but again, allowing the site penetrate from the outside, from the edge, into the building. And here, finally, a terrific effect, you not only can go through the building itself, but you also look completely through the building to a terrific number of layers, which are, even if you stand there, parallel, frontal to you, if you look through this column, which do not only line up in this direction, but also line up in this direction. And again, it's only achieved because of this particular approach from the edge into the building. Another view, again, looking from here underneath the building. Again, the view is not only opened up that way, but it's also opened up that way completely through it, at least on one level. Again, a complete uh, <coughs> integration of site and building, of walk and building, of the space around the building and the spaces within the building. Here, another view of exactly the same condition. Down below here, you see that if you look through, you don't have again only the convex, the, uh, convex plane almost not accepting you, not inviting you, but at the same time, because of that plane, you have again a frontal plane coming down and even inviting you to go penetrating into the building at this side. Again, the edge is established. This form here relates between the direction of this building and between the diagonal direction of the major mass, of the major cube of the building, and also relates the major mass of the building which is diagonal to the parallelism of the two streets. But at the same time, by opening up this corner and undercutting it, it opens up again and again the space from the inside, from the outside in. And of course, this relationship works also the other way around. And here, finally, Again, and again, the same kind of arguments can be elaborated. I don't think that I have to repeat myself uh, too many times. I show, <coughs> uh, again, a view from this side, from here to this side, looking at this particular surface. And finally, standing on the ramp, and again, now, you see the site, again, taking into account within the building, and imagine only what would happen if this surface would go down. You not only would cover up the facade, but you also wouldn't have any kind of relationship between your path here and the path of the street. Again, erosion of the edge, relationship to the inside. And here, the other three, uh, the treatment of this particular corner, where even the corner itself turns, the brief away of the flag turns into an uh, open box corner at this point. Now, if we go inside, 
I would say a fantastic miracle happens because of all this very complex and complicated relationships which I tried to explain. Here we literally cannot anymore, I cannot, distinguish between reflection, illusion, and reality. Uh, <clears throat> it seems to me that this is the result of this completely new spatial venture which Corbusier tried to do in uh, Carpenter Center to try to organize the building according to the laws of the diamond and establishing, or as a result, having these incredible spatial relationships where you literally cannot distinguish anymore in the inside between interior and exterior where exterior and interior are equally well or, or uh, related to each other. And here I come back to my original thesis that maybe if we look at the spatial effects and of the spatial relationships which are established in this particular building, we could take it as a possible image, as a possible model, how within a city center, things might be related, particularly in a business or shopping or um, <clears throat> downtown area, where really there seem not to be any particular reason why certain things have to be more important than others, but where they are related to each other equally well and where they can establish uh, significant um, <clears throat> ways of pass and of uh, <clears throat> circulation. The path is not a promenade in the usual sense. It's not a promenade which uh, has a particular climax to which you arrive. It's not on an axis, but it's a promenade of episodes which where different kinds of relationships and aspects of inside and outside reality are established. And for uh, the last slide, which I would like to show here again, two other slides of the interior, where again you cannot re uh, distinguish clearly between reflection and reality. The only thing which one clearly can detect is that, of course, this is not a reflection, and this stair is not a reflection, and this slab, but this is a reflection, and the building there is a reflection, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> Now, the last slide is a very early collage by Georges Braque. And it seems to me what spatially happens in Carpenter Center is exactly what happens here in this painting. He does not actually make a building in order to define a space necessarily for a certain purpose, but the space of the building has no other purpose than to visualize in its inside what is around it. And it's very strange that if you go through the building, you only realize the site and the environment of the building itself only after having gone through, before, because before you didn't look at it. It's the same kind of collage technique. You use an existing site and you overlay it collage-wise in order to show it to you. You use the daily paper, you use a piece of paper, you use a piece of wallpaper, and maybe some additional lines in order to show, in order to make people see the daily newspaper, the, day, the, the usual texture of the wood and the wallpaper.